Hi everyone, welcome to the second day of the CG annual conference and welcome to join us for the session on coloniality and racism in higher education. The panel brings together four critical scholars working in this field and they will draw on empirical research and critical reflections to um, discuss the decolon decolonization and anti-racism in higher education and research. I'm Xin Xu, based at CG Oxford. I'm very delighted to chair this session and to introduce our speakers. So our speakers today are Sharon Stein, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Education Studies at the University of British Columbia in Canada, and a visiting professor with the Chair for Critical Studies in Higher Education Transformation at Nelson Mandela University in South Africa. And Sharon is joining us today from Canada, which now is uh, midnight, so thank you, Sharon. And our second speaker is Solomon Zewaldi, who is a lecturer both at the University of East London and at University College London. And our third speaker is David Muse, who is Deputy Director of CG and an Associate Professor in the Department of Education at Oxford. He's also CG co-investigator on Project 9, Mapping Supranational Higher Education Space. And also our fourth speaker will be Riyad Shatterham, who is an Assistant professor, Associate Professor of Higher Adult and Lifelong Education at Michigan State University. And due to the time zone constraints, our read will contribute via a pre-recorded talk. And each speaker will first give us a talk and will then have time for questions and discussions. If you would like to have uh, questions or comments, please put them in the chat so that we can invite you to ask your questions at that time. So now, without further ado, let's welcome our first speaker today, Sharon. So, so Sharon, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I should say it's not midnight, it's 2.30 in the morning. So forgive me, um, any lack of clarity, I'm gonna blame it on the time. <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me. I am um, joining you from uh, to traditional ancestral unceded indigenous territory of the Musqueam people. And um, this is currently known as Vancouver. Um, and I think that uh, this practice of acknowledging the indigenous territory that one is on is uh, becoming a common practice within the US and Canada. And um, although it can become tokenistic, um, it does serve as a, a consistent reminder of the fact that colonialism is very much alive and ongoing in this place. And um, not only acknowledging the colonialism of where I sit, but also the colonial um, dynamics that allow us to be connecting over these machines today, thinking of the minerals that go into the computers and the way that they are mined under um, very unethical conditions um, and other dimensions of, of what allows us to connect today and also being very present to that and our accountabilities in relation to that. And that's not just like a side note in terms of starting the presentation, that really is um, a grounding notion of you know, what I wanna briefly talk about today, which is um, our accountability for racism and colonialism in higher education spaces. Um, I also want to note that I am speaking from the North American context, uh, which is a particular context, as is any. And so my approach to coloniality and race is also very much shaped by my location, as well as my positionality as a white settler here. Um, so although coloniality and racism are, you know, global phenomenon, there's not just one single history and layer of racism and coloniality. There's multiple complexly entangled histories and genealogies of colonialism, as well as anti-colonialism and anti-racism. Um, and we really miss out on a lot when we flatten these and assume that they operate the same um, across contexts. And actually, I have a, a doctoral student who is raising the question of um, the UK's responsibility, not just for um, sort of their global empire in, in a general sense, but also specifically in relation to settler colonialism, 
um, in places like Canada and the US as well. So um, there's a lot of, of things to still be unpacked there. Um, but what I want to talk about today is um, some things that I have developed in collaboration with my research collective, uh, which is called Gesturing Towards Decolonial Futures. I've really found that um, to do decolonial work is not something that one can do by oneself. Um, it, I've been enriched very much by doing this in collaboration um, uh, across different kinds of communities and life experiences. And we have researchers, artists, activists, indigenous community knowledge holders who all inform the work that we do. Um, and I'm sort of the person on the team who focuses on higher education. So I'm gonna share um, two frameworks briefly today that um, we've been thinking about in general and then specifically thinking about in relation to higher education. And I, I've been told that sometimes these slides don't translate, so it's okay if you can't see it. It's also just for me <laughs> to have the notes. Um, but one of the things we've been talking about is thinking about responsibility also in layered ways. There's not just one um, form of responsibility or one way of defining responsibility in relation to coloniality and racism and thinking about it in higher education specifically. So we've been talking about three different layers of responsibility. The first one being attributability or recognition that the wealth and power of historically and predominantly white or what we might call white stream institutions are rooted in um, in historical and ongoing colonial harm. So extraction, expropriation, exploitation. And then the response that one might have to this sense of attributability would be something like acknowledging um, this fact through a formal apology of the institution, for instance, in relation to their complicity in um, slavery or colonialism, or you know, in my case, as I mentioned, a land acknowledgement, acknowledging the history and the ongoing coloniality of this place. So the second layer, and they get kind of, what do you say, progressively deeper, we might say, is answerability or recognition of one's personal role in the systemic dimensions of racial and colonial harm. So this might show up like saying, um, okay, I as an individual have this responsibility to advocate in my institution for institutional changes, like adjusting admissions policies, um, increasing the hiring of indigenous or black faculty, um, and addressing or interrupting the hegemonic whiteness of the institution in various ways. Now, the third layer, um, which we might say is the deepest layer, uh, or the, the, there's three layers going on even in that, that last layer, is the idea of accountability and recognition that, yes, one is systemically accountable in relation to um, these histories and ongoing legacies of harm, but also individually complicit. And thus, you have both an individual and a collective debt that needs to be addressed in relation to racism and colonialism in the university. So this might look like, yes, supporting those institutional changes, but also in the case of, uh, let's say white faculty like myself, there's a question of what social and material advantages will I need to give up uh, in order to enact the kind of repair that we would need to address these legacies of racism and colonialism. I think I only have a few more minutes, so I'm just going to briefly review the second, um, the second framework here, and that is uh, four different approaches to addressing coloniality and racism in white stream higher education, and I'll just review them really briefly. And again, these kind of get progressively deeper as you go on, although, of course, it's not a linear process, um, and some people stall or some institutions stall at the first place. And I would say that first spot, the basic approach is that of recognition. Um, and this again may look like publicly acknowledging and apologizing for institutional complicity and racism and harm, the need to acknowledge harm done um, by the institution. The second layer would be representation saying, okay, we've made this apology. What are we gonna to do to actually increase the presence of racialized and indigenous people and knowledges in the institution? Um, so needing to change, in some cases, some places might say the objects of the institution. And often this is conceived as a concession to racialized and indigenous peoples um, that the institution is making. And they sometimes frame themselves in as, they, as if they were benevolent for doing this. Um, the third layer would be that of redistribution. Um, so actually not just creating a few more positions, but saying we need to really think about how we're allocating our resources, our money, our power, our land, and redistributing some of that to racialized and indigenous people in the institution 
and perhaps communities that the institution is working for. And I've heard people talk about this as, um, you know, this is putting our money where our mouth is. It's not just saying it's important to us, it's actually enacting some kind of systemic change. Um, and then the, the fourth position is actually reparation. Um, and this is committing to enacting restitution for racial and, and colonial dispossession. So not just saying, okay, we're gonna put aside a few of our existing resources, but actually asking where do these resources come from to begin with? And given where they came from, how do we return what was stolen in terms of stolen labor, stolen lives, stolen land? Um, and this is, you know, an area that most institutions are um, thus far pretty much avoiding. And sometimes they're calling things reparation that other people suggest is not true reparation. Um, but it is an emerging area of interest. And there are people calling for this um, in the context of Canada and the US, for instance, there are indigenous movements uh, under the title of land back, which is we don't just want a land acknowledgement. We don't just want indigenous representation in the university. We don't even just want some of your resources we actually want our land back. It's not a metaphor. Uh, and institutions are currently grappling with what this means. And uh, I look forward to talking about that and other things with you in the discussion. Thank you so much, Sharon. That's really fascinating. And there's a quick question from our audience asking if it would be possible to share the Prezi slide uh, later because uh, in, at some of the screens, it might not be as easy to read the texts. Thank you so much, I can see you nodding. Uh, and thank you. So next, can I welcome Solomon for the talk, please? Yep. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to, to share my I have a few slides, yeah. Uh, I sent it to to you. Probably you can try to to share that for me. <laughs> yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, one minute. Let me. Can see the slide is yep. up now. Yes. Yep, it's, it's, it's up now. Yeah, but I can't. Um, yeah, you, I, I mean, I can't go through the slides. Yeah, can, can you, you, you just have to ask me to move them to just say next slide? Uh, all, all right, okay, okay. Yeah, but let, let, let's go to the next slide here. Yeah, so this is the, the outline of, of uh, my talk. So I'm simply questioning. Well, I, I, I strongly believe the effort to decolonize the HE curriculum is so disappointing, disappointingly slow. And I find that very um, puzzling and very surprising in view of uh, you know, the, the, uh, the burgeoning publication of critical texts, you know, crit you know, the texts trying to critically look at um, you know, all forms of inequality um, and, and the oppression in the context of higher education yeah, increasing and also the uh, proliferation of uh, initiatives uh, or organizations or forums like C CDHE, uh, you know, that really purport to, uh, to fight colon coloniality and uh, racism in, uh, in HE. So I, I found um, Herbert Marcus, uh, a German born uh, American philosopher. Okay, yeah, he, he died in, in, uh, in the US. I found this concept of uh, repressive tolerance as a, a really powerful and useful uh, conceptual framework to look at some of uh, the things that really perpetuate and maintain racism and coloniality through uh, Eurocent Eurocentric uh, epistemologies and pedagogical practice also, okay, which work together to, to ignore and silence uh, calls for uh, radical change, but, you know, such as you know, uh, decolonizing the curriculum or even uh, wider political movements like BLA, Black Lives Matter. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, this is Anisha. I mean, this is just one example, for example, to show how progress is very, very slow. Gary Locke says uh, progress on narrowing the ethnicity gap continues to be slow, and the white BAME gap and the white black gap 
each on average changed by 0.3 percentage points, okay, in a space of like nearly 20 years. And at this rate, he says uh, it will be in 2771 when the white BAME awarding gap will close in 2085 and 86 when the white black awarding gap closes. Yeah, I mean, he's very generous. I, I don't even see this uh, closing even, even by 2085 and 2086 because nothing fundamentally changed unless we um, start to, to reimagine and, and uh, decolonize not just the curriculum, but the whole uh, higher education management policies and structure. And that doesn't seem to, to be happening uh, as quickly as I would have liked at least. So yeah, but I, I would say Gary is uh, very optimistic. Yeah, uh, although he finds this depressing. Next slide, please. Yeah, so where did this all start? Probably, yeah, probably 20 enslaved Africans, you know, arrived at Point Comfort, no, currently Hampton in Virginia 400 years ago. Yeah, about 400, yeah, 1619. Okay, probably the start of colonialism, racism, and what happened there? Okay, then people were, uh, you know, made to, to, to lose their names, cultures, values, belief systems, and everything. Okay, this is just, one of the, the historical imperialisms we can we, we can talk about slavery and then followed by colonialism and uh, you know more than 400 years you have now black lives matter for example which uh, has forced a profound moment of reckoning okay by ex exposing the continued legacy of slavery and other forms of histori historical imperialism like colonialism but at the same time it's also disappointing there is a, a disappointing resistance that's going on in the name of promoting tolerance, freedom of speech, and academic freedom. Yeah, uh, let's see. This, this is where the idea of repressive tolerance comes to, to help us uh, think about and uh, uh, analyze what is going on in terms of progress uh, um, uh, in the, in the, and uh, de uh, decolonization of, of the curriculum. Yeah, uh, so. What is uh, re uh, repressive tolerance? And next, I have one more slide. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, so Marcuse uh, talks about uh, repressive, repressive tolerance, which he defines as the acceptance of social and governmental practices and policies, actions which restrict freedom in an absolute sense. So he coined the term um, in 1965, you know, long before I was, I was even born, but I find it very extremely relevant for now. So one form of repressive tolerance for Marcuse is tolerating under the guise of neutrality or freedom of exp expression, opinions that are regressive, repressive, and objectively incorrect. But I will give some examples later and giving repressive ideas the same platform, okay? Uh, and he believes this does not promote tolerance, but only perpetuate the status quo, which leaves the ruling power structures untouched. Um, so the, um, he, he believes, you know, the Marcus argues that an all embracing tolerance of diverse views in curriculum, classroom discussion in pedagogy, Marcus argues ends up legitimizing an unfair status quo. So such tolerance for him is repressive and not, not liberating. Um, so the, the argument that we need to tolerate diverse views, so we need to diversify the curriculum, uh, you know, does not cut it for, for, for Marcuse. Uh, and I, 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 I couldn't agree more. So re re repressive tolerance, he argues, simply ensures that, you know, adults or students be, uh, believe that they live in an open society characterized by freedom of speech and expression, while in reality, their freedom is being constricted, okay, even, even further. Um, He, Marcuse explains that repressive tolerance has two, two dimensions. So the first is like tolerance in the name of impartiality or fairness or even handedness, okay, but works to perpetuate the status quo, which is white supremacy, racism, and, and, and colonialism. So, you know, you, we try to justify it in academia that students giving equal weight or consideration to perspectives, for example, that were racist. Okay, simply advance the interests of uh, the status quo. 
He gives some examples, for example. Okay, if you look at the teaching of creationism versus evolution, for example. Okay, and we, we are presenting this as, as two legitimate and equally uh, you know, scientific arguments that merit attention. So such a position, for example, implies that a valid choice exists between, between these two, creationism and then evolution. Uh, and that is fine for students to choose which they believe is the more scientifically accurate. And he has a problem with that. We can also look at the teaching of climate change. Okay, so climate change that analyzes global warming, okay, as a contested theory. So you have people coming out saying climate change is a hoax. So are, are we giving the students the freedom to weigh these two? Climate change as, a, you know, catastrophic, which is really it is, and climate change as hoax, which is unscientific and uh, not supported by any evidence. We can also look at the bell curve, the 1994 famous book, uh, you know, that, that tries to justify um, uh, low level intelligence of uh, uh, black people. Okay, and that in which why he, you know, he argued white's innate superiority of Europeans in general uh, over, over black people. We can also look at, you know, very sadly, the debate around uh, gun law in the US. You know, my, my deepest condolence to the families in, in Texas. I have a, a child in primary school and I cannot imagine the pain that they are going through now. Um, and the debate against and for uh, gun law, gun control, even you know, gun law around schools is being debated as, as if the two are uh, you know, equally scientific and merit similar, similar attention. And, uh, you know, and this happens in a country that has the audacity to call other cultures and other countries barbaric. And I don't know anything more barbaric than killing primary school children. Okay, and uh, yeah, so in all these cases, the logic of diversity requires that we frame classroom discussions in the curriculum around these issues in terms of uh, equal and serious consideration should be given to both sides of the argument. So Margis argues that giving equal consideration to views that reinforce the interests of white supremacy, global capitalism, and religious fundamentalism, as, as we see in the case of creationism and evolution. Okay, so, you know, teachers, well, academic staffs end up undercutting probably their own intention of developing students' powers of critical thinking. The second dimension uh, of repressive tolerance is a way repressive tolerance marginalizes dissent dissenting views and efforts for uh, democratic social change or uh, calls for social justice, we just appealing to support them. So how does it do this? So repressive tolerance marginalizes dissenting views, like the effort to decolonize the curriculum by ensuring the continued marginality of minority views, you know, placing them in close comparative association with the dominant view. So when, when you widen the curriculum, for example, to include dissenting and radical perspectives, okay, alongside the mainstream perspective, the minority perspective is always overshadowed by, by, by the, main, the mainstream one. Okay, so as long as dominant white stream perspectives are included as one of you know, several possible options, Okay, for, 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 uh, for the study of uh, uh, climate change or gun law, okay, uh, you know, as long as they're perceived as alternatives, there will always be uh, that tendency on the part of uh, students or wherever we are teaching, uh, you know, the tendency to turn to the mainstream, to be attracted to the mainstream view at the end of the day. White stream is a term that critical theorists use uh, uh, to, to, to describe. Um, how whiteness, uh, you know, um, subtly um, reflects white supremacist things um, and the, you know, the, the Eurocentric nature of, of the curriculum. So what, where do we, we, we go from here? So repressive tolerance is a thinking tool. It can help us to, to understand why some things are perpetuated, why change is so slow, progress is so slow. Yeah, but de decolonizing the curriculum or the pedagogy is, you know, simply undoing of colonialism. So it started where people were, you know, uh, exterminated, you know, their, their values, their names, everything have been uh, devalued and downplayed and they lost. And really the real question is to, to recover that. Okay, but 
what is the current understanding of you know, decolo uh, decolonizing curriculum or decolonizing the university? You know, a lot has been published. Um, it takes different meaning and, and uh, uh, meaning and interpretation. So decolonizing the curriculum or the higher education institutions is a, a very tough ask, even in Africa, you know, where, where I come from. You know, probably um, in many institutions, the conversation has not even uh, started. Yeah, for forgetting in, in, uh, in Western Europe. Um, and the, the most important challenge that I see is most current teaching staff or administration in higher education institutions are simply uh, not prepared or underprepared to champion uh, decoloniality. As most of us, most of us as a product of coloniality, educated by a colonial education system. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, it pains me to say this coming from Ethiopia, the only country not colonized uh, by European colonial powers, but the curriculum remains as colonized, highly colonized. So I believe decolonization requires decolonized uh, scholars, okay, and then we, with a highly decolonized mind to, to take the task uh, forward. And I don't think decolonizing the curriculum would be possible without decolonizing the, the university itself. I mean, the, 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 the bigger sector, the higher education sector. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'd, I'd be happy to, to discuss this further in, in discussion. Thank you so much, Solomon. That's really thought provoking. And uh, at this point, I will hand over to David for his talk. Great, thank you. And um, right, I'll start at the beginning. Um, thank you very much, um, Shin. So um, I am talking um, about bibliometric coloniality. A little story to start with. Um, I've been speaking to many African publishers over the last couple of years about the challenges of running academic journals in an underfunded and geographically stigmatized ecosystem. One editor said to me, he'd set up 16 journals and he said, I can't fight the Elseviers. I have to pursue asymmetric tactics. And so, so what I want to think about today is, is how the profitability of a global publishing economy and a geographically unequal credibility economy together reinforce what we're calling bibliometric coloniality. So I'm taking us from the classrooms that um, Solomon describes to thinking about the research system. And I've been doing this with Abigail, Kelsey and Natasha. So a little bit of context, um, post-colonial um, independence Africa saw lots of new journals being set up. It was a vibrant time for publishing. 50 years later, it looks very different. Structural adjustment policies, political instability, and the underfunding of higher education have all weakened the African science system. And this is now being steadily exacerbated by the growing influence of the major citation indexes. What you might call the metricization of the economy through citations is slowly but surely devaluing the credibility and visibility of many African scholarly journals, reinforcing epistemic exclusion and academic coloniality. So let's look at a couple of um, slides in the data. If you look at Elsevier's Scopus Citation Index, um, only 40 journals are included in the index, um, which aren't from um, Egypt or South Africa. So that's 0.001% of all the journals in that index. And um, you, know, the, you look at the numbers of, of Nigeria's biomedical journals in the index is less than 4%, according to Asubiaro. It's very hard to get in the index, and there's lots of reasons why that might be. Um, the technical expectations, the, um, the, the requirements for diversity of publication boards. So then what we've learned then is that the, the data from these citation indexes tell us very little about what's going on in African research ecosystems. Um, I did, we did this little diagram trying to map how, how much World Web of Science and um, Scopus, which are the two big blue circles at the top, how much they miss. Of, of other knowledge of other citation databases. It just reveals um, what we don't know, what we don't know about academic worlds beyond, beyond those dominant indexes. And I think um, there are other ways we could map these collaborations. We, we, we could map African science research. Um, and this is a sort of a visualization using um, academic EDU um, um, data rather than, um, rather than uh, web of science. And the nodes are research outputs and the thickness of the lines are co-authorship. So you see on the left, um, you know, using AD, Academia EDU, you get a much richer sense of, of what's happening when, within, within African and between African nations around science productions. Now, I have to admit that 
I'm not a science metrician, um, and I think whilst this is very useful, what I think is most important from my perspective is actually talking to people and, and trying to understand quite how hard it is to run a, um, an academic journal within these contexts, within the context of, of um, um, you know, resource constraint. So um, this is an example of a, of, um, a Nigerian journal um, which was set up um, um, in 1975. Um, and Nigeria has a really rich um, set of institutional journal cultures. Uh, many faculties host their own online journals. Um, most universities have a journal or two, even the newest private universities. Some disappear after a few issues, but, but this one has been going for a long time. Um, I, and the, the challenge, of course, that Nigerian researchers face is that one would expect um, them to publish, um, their institutions require them to publish internationally um, in order to get promoted, and yet that they want to support local journals or want to get their research circulating um, to support local networks. So they're, they're caught in a paradox. Um, and so we spoke at length to the um, editor of this, um, Niger Tech, his um, name is um, Emeka Obey, who's you know, the past editor-in-chief, and he described just quite how much work he had to do to, to get this journal up and running. Um, he described how you know he wanted to, 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 to sort of to, to, to change its fortunes, to, to bring it online, to use open journal software systems to publish it. He was determined that the, the journal, which was much older than many of these new journals, as he put it, it shouldn't die off. And so he tried very hard um, to um, ensure that this journal, I'm not sure who's, um, who's that, who's, who's that? Someone's um, phone calling. Is it okay, David? It's fine now, yes. So um, let me carry on. Um, so he described just how much um, effort and time he was putting into running this journal. And um, he said, um, when I can't sleep, I put my laptop on. There's always more emails and responses. An author submits an article and wants a response in 24 hours, but it takes them six weeks to reply to, to do a review. Um, he'd even describe the challenges of having, having to have your generator on all day long because that's the only way in which you can get um, enough power to run to, to, to run the software to, to run the computer. So, so what we're seeing then here then is a sort of a, a form of, of, of bibliometric coloniality that's sustained through this unequal political economy. But there's also a, a racialized economy, I would suggest, of academic credibility. And this is where you now need to look at the, at the major commercial science journals and the, and, and the science media to understand how the inequalities I've described in terms of resource are also reinforced by um, a, a culture of, of sometimes dehumanizing, sometimes almost racist um, discourse around so-called um, predatory journals. And so um, if you look at nature, they regularly run stories on 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 how to spot a predator, you know, on on predatory publishing. And then Elsevier, the, the web, um, the publishing um, house has a has a YouTube channel, which teaches people how to spot predatory journals. Um, and even even academics have a responsibility here. And you know, a paper on the quality of education in Sub-Saharan Africa highlighted how journals that weren't in Scopus, they described it as them as not reputable. This was reported um, as, um, as these were predatory journals. So I think that the discourse of, of predatory publishing is very dehumanizing. It's often, it's often presented very emotively. We did a sort of analysis of, of the, the metaphors and the language that get used um, to describe these journals. Um, and I think this is absolutely taken up also within, within the Nigerian science system by Nigerian academics. One editor said to us, when somebody says the journal is something to do with Nigeria, those from Europe look at you twice, even if you're telling them the truth. So, so they're facing this uphill battle, both um, in a political economy that's rigged against them, but also in a, in a, in a set of geographical stigmas and a credibility economy. So what do we do? How do we get beyond this? Well, one way, obviously, is, is to think about um, trying to build alternative credibility economies. So here I'm suggesting not not a sort of ontological commitment to, to a radical alterity or to going beyond the abyssal line, but it's sort of the low theory, the everyday work of trying to rethink how we, um, what, what citation data we use. Um, at one Nigerian editor said, look, we need, to, we need to adapt our own metrics and standards of indexing, as well as using the international ones. 
So it, as well as thinking about alternative metaphysics, it's also very much about the hard practical work of developing African indexes, challenging the discourse around predatory publishing, thinking about bibliodiversity, local infrastructures, funding local ecosystems. So in conclusion, um, I, I try to reflect on, on the coloniality of publishing. I think we do need to build a more equitable science system. This needs alternative credibility economies uh, and a bibliodiversity, absolutely, and a world, as Escobar puts it, a world in which many worlds might fit. Thanks very much, Jin. Thank you so much, David. That's really fascinating and also so much like rich uh, stories and voices and, and the empirical data. And so at this point, I think I will invite the talk from Riyadh, which is a pre-recording. Um, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for having me uh, asynchronously. Sorry, I couldn't be there. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to, to present with this wonderful panel of colleagues. Um, here, what I'm going to do today in a very brief presentation is to share some of my thoughts that's coming out in our forthcoming handbook chapter in the Oxford Handbook of Education and Globalization, uh, co-authored with my colleague Kirsten Edwards at Florida International University. And here we're going to talk about how race and racism uh, traverses globally through mobilizing whiteness. And um, this forthcoming chapter is actually, oops, I'm trying to go to the next slide, um, is for, is, it comes from, uh, extends our previous work uh, that was recently published uh, as called Whiteness is Futurity and Globalization of Higher Education and the information's right there. Um, but uh, it's also, we basically borrow from that in order to uh, define what we mean by whiteness and futurity. So by whiteness, we're referring to the state of knowing and being that creates a superstructure that privileges white uh, people, institutions, norms, but also is a form of orientation that, environment, that uh, orients social and political environments to benefit white life. Whiteness also signifies an unfinished business that has both structural and symbolic dimensions, structural such as capitalism, uh, political economic power, and so forth, but symbolically in terms of imaginaries, lifestyles, cultural norms. Race and racism, um, according to our paper, is also something that's not uniform, but acts as a transnational force. And by futurity, what we're referring to is this idea of being that is tied to an imagined time that is yet to come or the way in which yet to come is invoked. So, um, what do we mean by whiteness as futurity? So whiteness and futurity move from this idea that race and racism is just lost, lodged in the past and present, but rather it also colonizes our ways of being tied to features. Um, and so it has these three components that are mutually constituted, but also may work independently. One is this idea that whiteness shapes future aspirations of higher education subjects, uh, particularly those that are seeking global subjectivity. It also demands continuous invest, continual investment in whiteness because whiteness produces these global parameters that compel particular resource investments. And by resource investments, we're talking about not just material, but also affective investments. Um, and another very key component for this idea of whiteness futurity is that it's malleable. Um, whiteness is malleable in the sense that it is shapes fits or disguises itself um, to recenter itself in various contexts. Here, white supremacy, because of its malleability, it goes beyond corporal bodies or things to instead uh, encompass a process whereby non-white bodies and spaces can symbolically, as well as materially, project and gain advantages of whiteness. So in terms of mobility, um, one is the way whiteness and futurity is manifest is through the ways in which popular culture acts like this public pedagogy, shaping social imaginaries of whiteness globally. And here the role of Hollywood, Bollywood, social media, movies, television shows, um, generates these aspirations for certain regions by attaching positive feelings or aspirations towards certain regions whereby one can help to disentangle oneself from precarity, 
right? And so, you know, uh, like shows like Friends, um, Legally Blonde, movies like that can help project that. But also global media and even local media can mediate cultural familiarity with certain regions. Um, and in doing so, it helps to uh, catalyze mobility. So for instance, when we talk about the Korean wave, Haiyu, that is in many ways shaping neighboring regions for student mobility because students feel that they are familiar with Korean culture, hence therefore are more amicable to go to such places. But also whiteness is featurity is reproduced through institutional and regional banding efforts. For instance, Singapore signifies itself as the Boston of Asia. Here again, a particular template is used of whiteness to then show and project one's um, global stature. Um, whiteness as featurity also mo mobilizes the movement of physical bodies. And so, for instance, when we look at trends of student mobility and so forth, though that's been curbed, um, a lot of it is accessing global resources, but also global subjectivity, in other words, credentials that will allow them to be mobile. And so it helps to improve their employment opportunities, both locally and abroad. And so there's that's this whiteness as futurity helps mediate this kind of uh, aspirations towards moving towards the global north from the global south in order to access such resources. Um, but one could argue that now that we're seeing this movement eastward in terms of towards Asian higher education, i.e. China, Japan, and South Korea, we would argue that in many ways, eastward move, movement exemplify how these regions are achieving proximity to whiteness. In other words, they're making whiteness within reach um, in non-white locations uh, for non-white actors nearby to access geopolitical privileges tied to the global economy. Beyond just students, but also because of the malleable nature of whiteness, non-white actors are investing in bringing in white bodies um, in non-Western regions. So this allows non-global uh, North faculty to be mobile, particularly those with white higher education credentials to be recruited to improve one's global stature. Um, and, 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 and while non-white bodies often move uh, for economic survival, white bodies, particularly Global North faculty, can, can move around for cultural curiosity and not necessarily just economic survival. Um, finally, we talk about the mobility of resources. And I'm just looking at my time. Um, whiteness as future also creates these anticipatory logics around resources. In other words, non-white actors, in order to prepare for the global economy, in order to access the global economy, um, allows the because of the malleable nature of whiteness, programs and institutions that are predominantly white are mobile. And this is exemplified through international branch campuses, but also more recently, the resurgence of education hubs. Um, these areas highlight, for instance, how not only is there is a malleable nature of whiteness, but also how non-white actors and regions aspire towards global whiteness, invest in whiteness by investing in such international brand campuses or in producing such education hubs um, because they want to create more concentrated areas of whiteness to be consumed in terms of knowledge, institutions and gateways to the global economy. So we see these hubs, but international branch campuses as gateways to the global economy, but also this is whereby we see not only the malleable nature of whiteness, but also the ways in which uh, these regions are aspiring, but also investing in whiteness in order to either access the global economy to curb the flow of their own national uh, citizens going elsewhere by bringing whiteness to the home. In other words, internationalization of home. So to end, um, I just wanna say whiteness as futurity is not something that cannot, can be easily fixed. It raises some modern et onto epistemic grammar issues and we need complexity in addressing it. But in terms of more importantly, we need to examine racialized processes beyond national containers and across scales, but also we need to examine future facing higher education policies and practices. And finally, we need to consider our own complicity to whiteness given its malleable nature. With that, I will end. 
I'm so sorry I couldn't be there for the discussion, but I hope this presentation op opens up questions and issues, and please reach out to me if you have questions. Take care. Bye for now. Thank you very much uh, to Ria's contribution, and also thank you, Kali and Trevor, for making the pre-recording happening. And so now we have a really lots of um, discussions and questions. Um, and so perhaps at this point, can I first invite Sylvie to uh, ask your questions or share your comments, please? Yes, and thank you, everyone. I think this panel is fantastic for how well all of the presentations connect. So I had directed this question initially at Solomon, but I, I think it's relevant as well to to Sharon and to David and probably links as well to Riyadh's presentation. Um, so my comment was, how how do we shift the, the norm away? Um, Solomon's use of the concept of repressive tolerance was really insightful um, and his insight is that in the curriculum, if we bring alternative marginalized perspectives into the conversation with a dominant hegemonic perspective, then it's likely that the dominant hegemonic perspective will continue to win out. And I think this is relevant to David's comments about bibliometrics as well. Um, so how do we shift that norm? That's an enormous question, but any insights would be gratefully appreciated. I wonder if any of the speakers would like to make a start. Yes, please, David. That's a great question, Sylvia. I mean, I think, I think um, it's I, it's important. It's such an important question because I think it's easy to sort of say, right, well, we need to sort of have a radical, a radically different way of thinking about the world, a sort of ontological jump beyond the abyss. And I do think there's also a role in just in the everyday sort of mundane work of rethinking who's on committees and, and what, what data is used. And obviously a lot of it's you know, absolutely down to money and what sort of money there is for, for, um, for research funding, say in Africa and in journals, it's, you know, um, that, that links then to credibility as well. So, I mean, I think it's a good question because it is about the slow, difficult work of shifting norms. I wonder if uh, Solomon or Sharon have this place. Yeah, just just a point. Probably a way forward is to think of um, you know independent uh, standalone courses and programs. Uh, you know that that exclusively focus on uh, you know climate climate change or anti racism. Yeah, not not presented as an, an alternative to. Uh, a mainstream uh, um, curricula or, or, or program of study. I mean, one way forward is we shouldn't present this as, you know, a, an effort in diversifying curriculum and present, you know, the, the topic uh, of equality and oppression, um, you know, as just one alternative with, with the status quo. It should be an independent study on, on its own. So anything that's closer, so this I've seen in the UK is probably the launching of uh, Black Studies uh, uh, at uh, Birmingham University, not 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 University of Birmingham, the, the other the other university the other university in Birmingham. Yep. So a, a course, a degree in Black Studies, you know, independent on its own. So we, we can think of uh, and we should think of something something like that if we want to recover and give. Um, a true li liberating tolerance, not repressive tolerance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I wonder if Sharon has any thoughts to share. No, it's okay, you can go to the next question. Thank you. So um, now I will read out the questions from Tan, who's in a public space, so not able to ask the questions. Um, and the first question is for Sharon. So Sharon's framework do, uh, to do with racism comprehen is comprehensive and insightful. However, um, Tam's research evidence that leaders and peoples with authorities have a very important role here. So when people with power don't have will to solve this, it is hard for the system and resources to be used effectively to solve this issue. So if Sharon's framework has this element, we'll think about incorporating this. And the second question is for David. 
to this talk about journal is interesting, I would like to ask publications from non-Western and non-English countries that have massively increased, but most journals still have most members in editorial board coming from the Western and English countries. Would you think journals would welcome editors from non-Western countries more? And also, I would like to invite Susie at this, at this point to ask her question so that the speakers can respond to those uh, the, the questions from both audience. Susie, please. Thank you, Shen, um, and thank you to all the speakers. Um, my question, as you can see, it's taking up all the space in the chat there, but um, it's sort of half an observation, half a, a question, but um, I really, um, I think, uh, you know, do, how do the panel think that we can um, move a bit faster in terms of incorporating these um, or acknowledging, you know, problematic um, uh, academics from the past and, and um, you know, how they've sort of um, uh, conceptualized, for example, societies and things in other subject disciplines. So I, it, it always saddens me some, you know, sometimes to sort of see these really rich discussions happening among audiences that are sort of, you know, sort of preaching to the converted, if you will. And I feel like that there needs to be more done in other subject disciplines that are not uh, overtly or explicitly to do with the social sciences or history and, and race related topics. So how can we, you know, what language can we use? What can we say um, to promote this idea that it is beneficial to talk about these things in other subjects, such as you know, the natural sciences, you know, math, statistics, there are so many examples where this is relevant. Um, so yeah, a kind of sort of practical question, you know, how, how do we get the message out there that it's not really, you know, I, I suppose going to Solomon's point as well, you know, it's not about, you know, uh, ju just I, I, or only about, you know, uh, tolerance and diversity and that sort of thing, but it, it furthers the subject discipline as well. Um, and so how do we actually get that message across, I suppose, is uh, probably a, an impossible question, but just some, it'd be nice, it'd be interesting to, uh, to know what the panel think about this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I wonder which speaker would like to make a start? I can go. Um, yes, please. So, yeah, I think one of the things that's, that, and I, I saw another question too about, um, about white staff and, and how they can get involved. So there's the question about leaders question about um, staff, and then the question about um, non-social science and humanities disciplines, I think. And I think one, you know, perhaps painfully simple answer is that if we need people in all kinds of spaces doing all kinds of work. And what that work is, is really gonna depend on who they are, how much power they have, what their position is. And, and there's no kind of universal formula, but I'm always looking, for um, kind of the catalysts in their role, whatever they might be, whether they're a leader or whether they're an administrative staff or whoever, and um, how do we support those people? Because I, when I do some work about decolonizing STEM actually, but I'm not a scientist. So I have to work with scientists who want to do something. And their question is how do you translate these things into these different contexts in ways that will be relevant for people? And that does take someone who's very familiar with the context, even if they're not familiar with how to do it. But if we can make the right connections and sort of strategic collaborations, then we can actually uh, move things. And I think one thing, I wanted to just give two examples. There was a question about like, what can, what can, can white people do in these roles? And there's a question about staff, but I've been thinking a lot about faculty, which is something I know the best. Um, there have been these, uh, reviews that my colleague has been reviewing uh, for funding for indigenous health research. And what he's finding is that there's a lot of non-indigenous people doing research on indigenous health. So one way that you know, white researchers can, can uh, make more space and uh, enact some kind of redistribution is say, okay, I'm not gonna be the PI anymore. <laughs> Maybe I can be on this project supporting indigenous faculty to do this work um, in, in perhaps working with settlers um, on our own crap that we need to work through, but I'm not gonna be leading this work about indigenous research because that's not appropriate, number one, and because there's an imperative for redistribution. I think the second thing I wanted to just say is that 
Um, there's a, there is a st strategy about working with people who want to do something but don't know how, but there's also the question of how do you work with and push those who are not interested. And one strategy that I have been trying with some success is to say, you know, as opposed to them thinking I'm the person coming with this critique, I say, listen, I'm here to help. There is a wave coming of young people and activists and other people who are going to push you and the institution to move. And then I give examples of places that have been pushed to do that, like a university here that was recently um, compelled to change their name. And I say like, it's much better for you if you start thinking about this now, um, rather than waiting until it's at your front door. So I'm trying to help you <laughs> not become totally irrelevant and get totally you know, steamrolled by this process. And um, that has worked with some people less so with others, but I think there's a lot of different kinds of strategies we can use to try and work with those who are extremely interested and don't know how, as well as those who are not willing, but when when kind of pushed a little bit could make some things happen. Thank you very much, Sharon. I wonder if David or Solomon would like to speak next. Yes, please. Solomon, did you? Yeah, no, I just, um, a quick, quick point. I, I, I shared um, a link to, one uh, small curriculum, online curriculum, where we tried to introduce uh, the issue of race and racism in the built environment, you know, architecture, you know, planning at, uh, at UCL. So we, we borrowed uh, the, the famous title from Gloria Ladson Billings, uh, what, uh, what is race doing in a nice field like education? And we said, what is race doing in a nice field like uh, the built environment? Uh, we came up and we uh, developed a small curriculum, online curriculum for students, because the, the built environment has historically been um, a field where nobody talks about race and people believed race and racism has absolutely no connection with such, uh, you know, um, a scientific um, area of study. So that's one small attempt, uh, you know, going on really strong. Uh, and the first of its kind to, for, for, for the Bartlett, uh, at least, you know, you know, there was no talk of race. And uh, I take Sylvie's point that we even don't look at, uh, have a critical look at uh, some of the things that we use most commonly, like the statistical tools like Spearman Rowe, for example. Yeah, nobody talks how it was developed, who developed it and when and for what purpose. So those are the little things, for example, people can, can try to do. So Spearman Rowe is like, you know, everybody uses a statistical tool. So how is it originated? What is the research and the study behind that scale? Is something, you know, uh, definitely where I come from in Africa, but I've never seen discussion of, uh, you know, the, the historical roots. Uh, of the, they're just taken as scientific and there's no, uh, there's no attempt to question, to critically look at how these things came about and what they represent and what they reinforce and perpetuate. So there are small things that, that uh, we can do, but I, I, I feel we need the, the, um, decolonized scholars, decolonized minds, which we don't have uh, in enough quantity, um, both here and probably more so um, back home in Africa. Thank you. So just to um, build on that, I mean, these are great reflections. Um, I couldn't agree more with um, Sharon and, and, and Zawilde. Uh, there's a, the, the Gyatri Spivak has this um, phrase, unlearning our privileges, our loss. And certainly as a white scholar, you know, there's a lot of unlearning. I, I am finding myself doing about my own discipline, about my teaching. And in some ways, a pedagogy of, of you know, unlearning is, is a good place to start in the classroom to recognize what people are bringing in, what, what, what we're taking for granted, what we need to think about. And so Susie, your comments about you know, how and when do we, do we build in that sort of, uh, of awareness such that we teach about the histories of our disciplines, Certainly, you know, I'm trained in anthropology and anthropologists are firmly oriented in the present, but actually the, you know, the history of anthropology needs to be unpacked regularly and, and, and thought about again and again. Um, and, and similarly, you know, the, trying to teach doctoral students about the, the economies of, of research and how, how that university works and the coloniality that's sustained within a qualification like the PhD. I mean, you know, there's so many things to learn about. And I guess um, in relation to the specific questions around publishing, and I see Jan raised this question as well as um, um, the other, other um, speaker, the, 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 there's a way in which 
journals do, of course, carry on, um, even when they try and widen their diversity a bit of their author editorship. They are based in certain places and they have a certain association with those places and the status that comes with those institutions that makes them seem out of out of reach for for many scholars who are in different credibility cult cultures where it might just feel like well they're not going to reply or it's going to take me two years to get a journal article published this isn't this is not for me so i think yes absolutely widening diversity is important but also i think changing changing thinking about the, the sort of global credibilities that um structure our, our, our higher education system feels really important. Thank you so much to all our speakers and also thank you so much to the audience for enriching this really open and rich and valuable discussions today. There are also some questions in the chat that our speakers may want to pick up later after the conference maybe, but due to time constraint, uh, we will uh, close the session very soon. And our next session is again another excellent panel and they will be sharing critical views on higher education and the economy you can find the link uh, in the chat or on the conference web page and thank you all again and hope you all enjoy the conference bye for now Action.